following is from a book by Ernst Meyer, who is considered one of the leading evolutionary theorists. He says, the fundamental difference between the first and second steps of natural selection should now be clear. At the first step, that of the production of genetic variation, everything is a matter of chance. However, chance plays a much smaller role in the second step, that of differential survival and reproduction, where the survival of the fittest is to a large extent determined by genetically based characteristics. So we have two pillars for evolutionary theory. One is chance, which is responsible for mutation, and the other is, is quote unquote, survival of the fittest or, or adaptation. In my view, the first statement, everything is a matter of chance, is right out of the Greek playbook. It really hasn't changed. And I'm going to be asking in a few seconds, is this scientific? Is this based on evidence? How many of you have heard of Carl Sagan? Just raise your hand. OK, he uh, obviously was one of the most famous astronomers of his day. He was on Johnny Carson. He made the phrase billions and billions quite popular. Um, and now with this bailout, billions and billions is turning into trillions and trillions. But he came up with rules for sound science in a book uh, called The Demon Haunted World. Because, because Carl Sagan was very much of a, uh, what you might call a strict scientist. And he wanted to see evidence for things if they were going to be considered scientific. Carl Sagan had a, several rules for sound science, and he had a baloney detection kit that he talked about in The Demon Haunted World. So some of the rules were propositions that are untestable and unfalsifiable are not worth much. And I don't quite agree with that, but that's what he said. Claims that cannot be tested, assertions immune to disproof are veridically worthless, whatever value they may have inspiring us or in exciting our sense of wonder. And the last one, experimental results, data, observations, measurements, facts. Those are the basis of sound science. So one thing I need to mention is even if something is not sound science according to these rules, that doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. Because you can have lots of theories that are not testable, or you can have lots of theories not based on observation, but they're not necessarily wrong. And I once read that um, astronomers and cosmologists saw something in the universe that was very, very unexpected. And within short order, 3,000 scientific papers have been written trying to explain what was going on up there. And 3,000 explanations cannot all be right. But that doesn't mean they're all unscientific. So we're going to do a little exercise. And this is going to involve you. Let's read this statement from a very well-known statistics textbook. The human race has an incredible amount of experience to assure the statistician that an honest, well-made die, properly thrown, will yield its six faces with almost equal frequencies. That is, any one of the six numbers is just as likely to come up as any other. Therefore, this method, limited only by the unavoidable small imperfections of the die, guarantees to each of the six persons the same opportunity to be chosen, their emphasis. Now, you may know that this, this thinking is the underlying viewpoint of how to take a random sample. Now, uh, let me ask, how solid is that guarantee? Let me just see a show of hands. How many think that guarantee is solid? OK, how many think it's not solid? OK. In my view, that guarantee is not solid at all. And, and we're going to get to that in a second. But let's do an experiment. Let's take this green die. And according to this, um, every one of these numbers has the same opportunity to come up when I, when I do an experiment. Okay, that's the whole idea of a random sample. Okay, randomness rules. So when I throw this die and catch it and it came up six, any of the others could have come up. So when I do that gazillions of times, and take a random sample of the small fraction that came up, that's going to tell me something about the big population. OK, it just came up six. Is there any evidence that it could have come up in any other way? Is there any evidence that when you do this experiment that in the future, 
when I, when I do it in a second, that all of those things that we see in the long run are available on the next toss. Okay, because the way you come up with it's one out of six is by doing it a gazillion times. And then you say, okay, I saw that each number came up about one-sixth of the time, so I'm going to backtrack and say that on the next toss, it's one-sixth. So I'm going to do this, and I got a five. But there was no evidence that, that this result that occurred could have been otherwise. Okay? But that's the line of thinking that's going on here. So we're going we're to explore that in a little bit. As I said, there's no evidence that heads and tails are equally likely in the coin toss or in the, or in the toss of the die. And I said earlier, this is not debatable, and I have a few aces up my sleeve, such as this one, to back me up here. And one of the aces is Richard Tolman, who wrote a book called The Principles of Statistical Mechanics. Richard Tolman is, was a very famous scientist um, who predates anybody in the room as far as when they were living. He wrote, the methods have to be based on account of their statistical character on some hypothesis as to the a priori pro likelihood of different possibilities. The hypothesis is introduced at the start without proof as a necessary postulate. So look at the without proof there. He put that in. He knows, because he's thought about the matter, that when you throw this die and you come up with a one and you say it could have been otherwise, that, there's no proof of that. Okay, now by the way, do you know who Richard Feynman was? He's a very famous physicist. He was the Richard C. Tolman Professor of Physics at Caltech. This book is 661 pages long, and it is not something that was written without thought. Uh, the problem is now that a lot of scientists haven't read it, or if they've read it, they haven't understood it. So we see that there's no evidence, it's without proof. Okay, now we're going to get to CFD. And a fellow named Nick Herbert wrote a book about quantum reality. And Nick Herbert is a physicist, and he is going to talk about ordering pizza and the idea of CFD. So in my pizza pie analogy, the CFD assumption means that I take for granted the notion that ordering any kind of pizza other than the one that I did in fact order would have resulted in its delivery. This CFD assumption, that hypothetical actions would have led to definite outcomes, seems reasonable, but it is, by its very nature, untestable, since each event happens only once. You can only order one pizza this Saturday night. Hypothetical actions would have led to definite outcomes. That's the thinking behind CFD, CFD assumption. Now, by its very nature, it's untestable. So let's think about that a little bit. I, I think it's pretty obvious, and you may too, but the way we tend to think is, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call up Joe's Pizza, and how many people want cheese, how many people want pepperoni, how many people want sausage? Okay, well, we're going to get cheese pizza. So we get cheese pizza, and everybody eats it, and let's say you get, you get heartburn. So somebody's going to say, you should have ordered pepperoni. If you would order pepperoni, I wouldn't have heartburn now. And everybody's going to say, because of the way we think, oh, yeah, we could have ordered pepperoni. You know, why didn't we order pepperoni? Now, have you ever, like, have you ever done anything stupid in your life? No, 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 you have not. No, I'm sure. But if you've ever done anything stupid, you might have said, why did I do that? Okay? You might have said, why did, why was I that dumb? Or why didn't I do otherwise? So this whole CFD is behind that. Basically, if you did something, the idea that you could have done something else is untestable, and that's called contrafactual definiteness. 